Our speaker tonight is Tyler Hoare, who in one um, newspaper news story was called the new wizard of winter finch forecasts. Tyler is from Ontario, as in Canada, and this year he took over the winter finch for annual winter finch forecast from the man who started it, Ron Pittaway. Tyler is a freelance biologist and ecologist whose previous major claim to fame was surveying shorebirds in James Bay, which is 10 hours by car, five hours by train, and 40 minutes by helicopter from home. He actually participated in the winter finch forecast for many years before Ron Pittaway retired, and now he is the head honcho coordinating the work of what was this year, 49 contributors from Newfoundland to Alaska. Actually, that's Newfoundland, but nobody pronounces it that way. No. We couldn't have flown him here to speak to us, but through the magic of Zoom, he's here to tell us about why we're seeing all these wonderful birds this season. So now I'm going to shut up and give the floor to Tyler. Thank you so much for accepting the invitation. Oh, thanks for having me here. I'll just share the screen. A second here. Thank you for having me. This is a amazing year to take over to be a winter finch forecaster. I was told when I took over to be conservative in my estimates and well the birds have exceeded my conservative estimates and then some. So it, I was always told that the birds exceed you don't exceed the birds because then people won't be happy. So we do this to start with Ron Pittaway. Next slide. Back in 1999 he is basically based around Ontario's boreal forest and what winter finches we'd be seeing in the, in the uh, winter in Southern Ontario. Then he started to evolve in 2003. He had, he had the format that we follow still to this day. And he picked more Eastern Canada. Then he started getting contributors from all the way up into the interior of Alaska and Anchorage. And he would send out midsummer a little request to people saying, okay, keep an eye on the cones and tell me what you see. And, then come back and bother people later on, myself included at times, to tell them what we have. So he, he's very infectious and very charismatic and he got a lot of people looking at trees. I admit every year before I took this over, I worked in Northern Ontario and I would drive for hours and stopping every half hour just to look at trees. Not look at the birds, just to look at trees. And if I saw two trees that didn't have a cone crop, I'd start looking at a bigger sample. So this winter finch forecast, as many of you probably know, is it's a pretty big event now in September. It, I, it is, it's big in Ontario, but I found out when I took this over, it has a much larger dedicated following, especially in the Eastern United States. People wait for Ron's word to drop, what will happen. Actually, I was told that bird seed distributors anticipate this forecast and if they could, can find out as soon as it's there what's happening. They do place their orders the same day it comes out. Well, I took over this run, retired in early August, and I took it over three days later. I was discussing with him over the last previous few years he, he wanted an apprentice, but we went nowhere with that. And then he surprised the world when he did the uh, retirement. So I took it over a couple of days later. The challenges in 2020 were I had five weeks to take over, communi communicate with everyone, get the report, every data back, prepare a report, and get it out within five weeks. And COVID-19 restricted a lot of travel. In Canada, a lot of small isolated towns were not letting people in from southern Canada in there at all. You just couldn't travel that those areas. Some of my, my routes I would go up to when the first COVID first happened, they, they, these towns are either fly in or by train or by winter road. They had, were actually plowing their winter roads weeks early because they did not want anyone to come in without containment. These are the species of trees we primarily sample that provide most of the food source for the winter finches. The Eastern white pine here and red pine are a big red crossbill source of food. White spruce is the driver of the boreal forest for, for the cone crops because so many species will actually feed on white spruce. And if it's a great year, 
the birds aren't going to move. They're going to stay up there even when it's minus 40, minus 50 Fahrenheit. Black spruce is the wetter version of the white spruce and it's quite widespread and it's another very important one. Balsam fir, fairly important one for red-breasted nuthatches. If everyone's been seeing the red-breasted nuthatches that moved out of the boreal forest in late summer, we knew even before we looked at the trees that the balsam fir crop was probably gonna be poor because the red-breasted nuthatches were leaving in such big numbers. This is one tree species that from coast to coast, all the reports I had was an extremely poor crop. I must have looked at maybe four or 500 balls and furs, and I can count on three fingers how many balls and furs I saw that actually had cones. It was that bad of a failure. Tamarack, also known as American larch, is another widespread crop across the boreal from Alaska to Newfoundland. It's a pretty good food source. Birches and alders, they are the red pole food source. If they have a crop, the red poles will not come south. Great news this year, other than one species of the tree called the swamp birch, which had a good crop, but wasn't so widespread, the white birch and yellow birch had a terrible crop this year from coast to coast. And once the red poles got through the swamp birch and started going further south in latitude, they found out their usual winter source of food wasn't there. So they did the march and they're still marching. Eastern white cedar, a smaller food source, but siskins and red poles would happily take it. Mountain ash species. The berries are a very important source of food for bohemian waxwings and pine grosbeaks. Pine grosbeaks absolutely love mountain ash berries. And if the crop is great, they're not going to move. The boreal forest, when I'll show you in a couple slides where the main crop of cones are, also has a very good boreal, has a very good mountain ash crop and other berry crop. Those Pine gross beaks up there are happy. The ones further to the east where they, the mountain ash crop was either poor or the robins and the black bears decided to clean it all up because they didn't have much other source of food. The pine gross beaks have had to move. Oaks, more for blue jays. Hemlocks are a crossbill favorite. Maples and ash are a source for the evening gross beaks. They love the keys and red cedar and fruiting bushes are smaller ones. We have a small run developed a small rating system. It's pretty generic because everyone's a volunteer who does this and they have different experiences with the actual tree crops. So we use their own judgment between poor, fair, good, excellent, and bumper. Most of the boreal forest, east from Lake Superior, probably about Duluth, Minnesota eastward is fair to poor. North of Duluth to Alaska, it's good to excellent, most of the uh, cone crops. This, in 2019, we had in Eastern North America, why you didn't see very many winter finches, period. We didn't even see them in Southern Ontario. The bumper crop of cones from Newfoundland almost to Alaska was almost generational. It was, these are white wing crossbills here. That's an adult male. These are juvenile white wing crossbills that just fledged probably within the last few weeks. The mom and dad migrated, that's where I was on James Bay, brought the new family in, dropped the kids off at cone crop, and then they started breeding up for a second time this year because I see this white spruce here is just overladen with cones and all these tamaracks are full of food. White wing crossbills will breed multiple times a year or any time of year. If they find a great source of cone crop, they'll settle in and breed. I've seen them in the dead of winter feeding young in the boreal forest where it's like minus 20 minus 30 Fahrenheit. They have a huge cone crop source so off they go. This year in the eastern boreal forest looks nothing like this. <laughs> These are all the source locations of all of our observers from coast of Newfoundland, the Maritimes, New England, most of them are in Ontario, northern Minnesota, Wisconsin, Manitoba, Northern British Columbia, all the way up to Nunavut and up here into the interior of Alaska. We'd love to fill that up with more observers and up this way in future years. In terms of the cone crop, from all the reports we had, this is the approximate area where the heavy spruce cone crop is. And thus a lot of white wing crossbills and siskins were moving there during the summer. 
east of here, the cone crop goes from great to fair and it drops down to basically a complete failure over here. The theme will be Quebec is your friend this, this winter and this talk. The boreal forest of North America, this is, uh, stretches from Newfoundland to Alaska. And I don't know why in this map, apparently they think global warming has happened because apparently in this map, Greenland has a boreal forest. It's been a long time since they had one. This is the basically what they call the nursery for North American birds. Most of the warbler species, the finches, sparrows breed throughout this forest. Now our first species is a unique one, the white winged crossbill. This year, white winged crossbills will tend to move east or west with the cone crop, more so than north-south. And this year, we have them in the east. They're seeing them now in, in towns in the east, but they're very small numbers. And the bird observatory in Tadoussac, Quebec, which is one of our fellow weather sites where we track migration early on, they have only had very small numbers of these bird species coming through. So we know in the east, there's not many, but there's not much food for them. So they are drifting down south. However, to the west, I was getting reports of them doing double clutches and from the Minnesota, Ontario, Manitoba border all the way to Alaska, I was getting reports of huge numbers of them all through the forest and in towns. And these, this species will happily stay in the boreal. It doesn't want to come out unless it has to. This is the estimated population of Canada, which is other than Alaska, Alaska probably adds another two and a half million. It's a quite a common bird. Ontario, you see that it's quite common in Ontario, but it does not want to come out of, to civilization. It's quite happy to sit and they utilize the cones. So it will move back and forth. And if you see numbers of these guys showing up, it's either a weather event or a cone crop failure. This is the currently an Ebert. As of this, this afternoon, all the recent reports of white crossbills. It looks like there's a ton of them. Most of these are ones and twos. Down here in the coast of Nova Scotia and the coast of Maine, down towards Massachusetts, is an event that happened even before I took over the forecast. Being a maritime climate, it, the wetter and the crop and milder, so they didn't have the third winter that we had in lots of North America. So they had a good cone crop. A lot of the finches moved there already in early summer and were quite happily feeding along the coast. Here, west coast of Michigan, it'll be a focal spot in the top. You'll, I'll point to it several times. And here's Tadoussac, Quebec. That's one of our observatories I follow. And Hawk Ridge here, here in Duluth is another great monitoring station. As you see, on the east side of Lake Michigan, there's very few white wing crossbills. The west side of Lake Michigan is full of white wing crossbills and all around the Superior. And this is the edge of the crop, heavy cone crop. Oops, this is what it was in October, just a few birds dr drilling down. In October 18th at Stony Ridge, they had 1800 white wing crossbills come by. Apparently set quite the record for Minnesota several times over. 48 hours before they had that, this area here had a significant freezing rain event. What we're thinking was that freezing rain event covered the cones and those birds went and got hungry and they went for a fly. And when they left the high cone crop area, they were hitting less of a cone crop. So they started moving and the birds that were in Northern Minnesota, Northwestern Ontario moved. And you see some of the early ones in the Minneapolis and into the Chicago area, but they're coming in this way. You see Michigan has nothing. The white wing crossbills are coming in this way and these ones are just drifting down from the North. So back two slides. So you see, you can see the evidence of the flight. They're all along, the, excuse me. They're all along this side of Superior and all jammed up on this side of Lake Michigan. That side of Lake Michigan has very few. Because it's showing the numbers were pushing that way in. And these guys are just slowly drifting down. The another species, the red crossbill. There's 12, sorry, 10 different call types they have, Cornell has recognized. 
and one became an, its own species, the Cassia crossbill in Idaho, because the non-migratory. The primary ones we have in the east are type 10, and they're, the, they're white pine, lovers of white pine. And this year we had a great crop of white pine. So they were utilizing it. This is a nice adult male. Here's some female or immatures with the male eating grit. The Eastern population in North America is only 175,000. It's over 5 million for North America. So most of these birds are Western Rocky Mountains, Cascades and that. This is where they were during the summer. What big white pine crop in New England, Eastern Ontario, Minnesota and the Upper Peninsula. They were quite happy they were breeding. And then they moved. They've dropped out, they've eaten themselves out of house and home, and now they're moving, marching southwest. The birds in the Upper Peninsula in northern Wisconsin are coming down towards Chicago, and other birds are drifting further that way. And down here is a population that's been all by itself for years in the Appalachians. They will mix with the other birds on eruption years. This is the pine siskin. This is the one that gave me a little bit of grief. We were, we knew they were there, but when we were starting in late summer, they were tracking them in Northern Ontario. In Eastern Northern Ontario, the numbers were dropping and they're picking up in Western Ontario. And people from Minnesota, right around Manitoba, all the way in Alaska were reporting huge numbers of pine siskins. So we figured they probably went west the same time with the crossbills. However, they didn't stay up there. They started in the fall to come out of the, the Western Canada and move in huge numbers down to the Western mountain ranges, all heading Southwest and through the US, heading Eastern Canada. And the ones that were Eastern Canada didn't have much food left for the fall, they drifted south. So we had a huge movement of pine siskins. This was in the summer in August, they were already starting to move. These are the birds that were near spruce bud where melt breaks in small numbers. And now in September, they just started coming out in large numbers. Now, this the comparison between 2019, the light pink, I mean, use these e-birds when it gets to this level, the light pink is small percentage of the point counts that are there are actually reporting this bird. So it's probably very small numbers. And the darker the color is where more of the birds are. So up through British Columbia, Alaska, and sitting in the boreal forest. Now, since they erupted out, they moved down the Rockies and all through North Carolina, Texas, Florida. There's one in Bermuda now. They went for a big move. People, bird watchers I talked to in New York State, New England, all and Pennsylvania are complaining because they've lost their pine siskins. They didn't, most of the pine siskins didn't even stay up in the traditional areas. They went down into the Carolinas, down on the Gulf Coast. They've just moved. They're an adaptable species. They don't just eat seeds, they'll eat the insects and all that. So they're, when they want to go, they decide to go. Now, here's my, one of my favorite little guys the common hoary red poles. They're resilient little ones and very charismatic as you see them at feeders fighting and playing or jostling through weedy fields. Some weedy fields you can sit there and look at it and someone told you half an hour ago there's 200 there and you can't see one. You turn your back and all of a sudden they all pop up, fly over 100 feet and drop back down. Sometimes they're undulating flights all over the field. Sometimes they're just sitting in the weeds or sitting in the uh, birch trees. These guys really love birch trees. Now, if you know any birch trees, ornamental or native birch trees or that have an actual, the, the wider seed pods, the really thin ones with like pencils and the male flowers for next year, the wider cigar, cigar ones or the seed pods, if you can find one that has that, keep an eye on that tree because they will find it eventually. The common versus hoary. The hoary red poles breed much further up. They breed above the tree line. They breed pretty much to the, almost to the North Pole. So if Santa Claus has a bird feeder, he has hoary red poles sitting there. They come down out of the boreal when there's a complete 
loss of all the birch and alder and willow seeds in the high Arctic and the mid Arctic. And then they join up in the flocks of the common red poles. And some flocks of common red poles, 100 common red poles might have 20 horries, might have zero. They're very erratic to find. They're much whiter. They have white under the tail coverts. And the bill sometimes looks a little pushed in, but there's a great variance between the, 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 the field guide hoary red pole and the common red pole. They, they, have, they can almost look common red pole like, or they can look like a textbook. So if you see one you're unsure of, it's quite okay to put down your checklist common slash hoary red pole. Because people tend to uh, try to break them down easily, but they overlap a bit. And you see the common red poles here. The males have the pink wash. And as you can see, the wash, the pink wash in their breast is quite variable in between individuals. It's the charismatic survivalist. If you have a tube feeder with niger seed on it and they find it, they will be your best friend and they're going to cost you an arm and a leg because they love the tube feeders. They are very charismatic. They're, they make the bubbly American goldfinch look like a, uh, a sullen little bird. These guys, they, they're just so enjoyable on a cold winter's day. You can see this one, male, really red breasted, very light washes, little heavier one there. They're tough little birds. They have adapted to survive in the cold boreal forest when there's a cone crop, when it's averaging a minus 18 Fahrenheit going down to minus 40 Fahrenheit many times. What they do is they have a pouch in their throat, which they'll come to your feeder or come to a tree, take as many seeds as they can quickly and jam them into this pouch. Then they'll fly in back into a tree someplace safe and warm and slowly digest their seeds so they're not exposed to the cold. Excuse me. In the cold winter days, they've seen at night, they will dive into the snow, tunnel in about a foot in the snow, make a little cavern in there and sleep there at night and then pop themselves out in the first thing in the morning back up for the day. There was research done in Alaska where they uh, took a common red poles and hoary red poles and basically they wanted to freeze them, see how long they could survive with a temperature drop. Common red poles could live to minus 53 Fahrenheit and hoary red poles to minus 88 Fahrenheit. So something as small as an American goldfinch that has a pretty high metabolism is pretty resilient to handle the cold northern winters. This is what Ontario here where we were having, this is early October. And this is the last two weeks of October. They just jumped out and they're moving down here as well. That is the last, that is the first two weeks of November. Just the explosion difference, how they came down. And these ones are coming down right across. This is currently, as of this afternoon at two o'clock, common red poles. They're everywhere. And you see, again, in this Lake Michigan thing, there's big numbers ringing the, both sides of it, which is telling us they're coming down from here, coming straight down, coming this way, coming in from the east. They're just coming south. Right now, the current boundary of mostly common red poles is south of Minneapolis, mid Illinois, on a line almost straight over to Washington, DC. And as these fields get covered in snow and they can't get their weedy seeds and they eat their tree crop, they're gonna find Niger feeders and they're gonna enjoy them. There, there you go. Put a buy, buy your Niger seed before uh, more of the seed set sellers know about that. They will also take black oil, but they do prefer the Niger seeds. So this is one of the bigger eruptions we have seen in several years for the common red poles. Purple finches. The one that people misidentify house finches with several times. When we have the uh, great backyard uh, bird count in February, we have to set all our filters around the trawl area to purple finch to zero, because there's a weird thing that has happened the last few years where feeder watchers record lots of purple finches, but not house finches. It's almost like there's a complete reverse migration because they will misidentify the purples and the house finches. 
for us in, in Canada, we're losing most of our purple finches this year. They're starting to, they started to move in August and ones that are not feeders have left us. It's basically birds that are tied to feeders right now that are holding. This is the nice male on the left. Looks like he's dipped in raspberry jam. That's one of the nicknames people will call it, raspberry finch. And I think she's equally as beautiful, the female. We're wondering why we are seeing more and more the last couple of years in Southern Ontario and Western New York and that during the summer. This is 2015, the population that breeds right up in here in Northern Michigan. The, the mountains, the Adirondacks, the Alleghenies, where they breed there and the forests areas in Southern Ontario. Five years later, we have a lot more birds showing up in the summer, which we didn't have before. And they're showing up breeding in, in ravines in the city of Toronto, which was unusual. So this year, we noticed something. By August, they were already starting to move along the coast, heading down in the Detroit area. This is August, September. They're all over Detroit already. And they're moving down. They're in New York City. They're probably Minneapolis area. I'm sure they were in Chicago by that time. In October, there's more birds in the US now than there is in Canada. And this is what it looks like currently. Most of these birds up in here are pretty much tied to feeders and they're ones and twos. They have pushed themselves down. I'll tell later in the talk, I'll give one of the reasons why we know their population is expanding. A certain little caterpillar is their friend. This is what their breeding season is, he, during the breeding season. They were heavily up here, mid Wisconsin, all the way over to Newfoundland. Now, and a few small breeding pockets down in the mountains. Now you see they've all shifted all the way down into central Florida, all along the Gulf Coast, down through the Carolinas, Missouri and all that is where most of them seem to be. But again, up here with the edge of the heavy cone crop, fruit crop, there's still a pretty good density up there. So they have, they have moved. And there's not, if they can't find the food they want, they're gonna keep moving south. And this is the one that so many American birders and Southern Canadian birders would love to see. They're a very resilient bird. They do not wanna come south unless they're forced to. Left is a nice male enjoying a little bit of snow on his beak and a female on the right. This species eats heavily, well, it eats seeds. It loves mountain ash berries and other types of berries, but they can survive being in the boreal forest because they'll eat buds. They'll eat tamarack, they love eating tamarack and larch buds. They'll eat small spruce buds. So it's an adaptability that the species has so they didn't have to migrate so much is they'll eat more or less, more or less nutritious food, but they'll consume it so they don't have to go on bad years so far away from home trying to find some food. When you go up to Northern Ontario or in, anywhere in the boreal forest in the winter during a bad seed crop year, you don't go look for the finches in the forest, you go into towns. Every little town that has a bird feeder will have their own little flocks of pine gross beaks. Some, the Southern boreal forest will have evening gross beaks, but all these little towns will have these little guys, actually fair size guys, size of, approximately the size of robins, and they don't know what people are. I went to university northwest of Toronto, and when the classes were changing, it's about 15,000 people on the campus, the classes are changing, and in the main walkway, there was a row of crab apple trees, about 50 crab apple trees. We had one winter where they were down there and they were eating the crab apples, and they were oblivious to the people, and most of the students walking back and forth were oblivious to them, walking within two, three feet of their heads. Neither, neither one paid attention to the other because they looked at each other and went, no, oh, you're a caribou or you're just a robin. This was the push in October. We knew they were starting to come because we knew the crop up here was a little iffy. But we found out that when you see a robin on your lawn, 
say thank you to it. Since the berry crop east of here was variable and there wasn't much of a food source for anything else, black bears and American robins went heavily after the mountain ash berry crop and the winter berry, the winter berry crop. So much so uh, bear technicians up in this area told me, it's a busy highway, Trans-Canada Highway up here. In the middle of the day, there's bears feeding 20 feet off the side of the road on the uh, berry crop there because there's no other source. So the robins, most of the pine grosbeaks will breed north of this line here. And the robins are here. So as they drifted down, expecting their food, the robins, the black bears, and, and to a lesser degree, the swings and thrushes were just clear cutting all the berries through here. And now as they push down here, the European starlings the raw and the robins and what bears are around at cleaning up what food source they have in front of them. So the pine grosbeaks speaks and now here are drifting down into the towns here. They are, they love feeders. They will come to black oil seeds quite happily. All these ones up here right now are probably at bird feeders sitting on black oil, but they love the small, the tiny little crab apple, ornamental crab apples. They love them. So if you know any around a section where there's 15, 20 of them, keep an eye on them because they're already being reported in Southern Wisconsin. And as the winter progresses, they'll drift down. This little event here, we didn't know was going to happen. We knew the food wasn't that great up in Northeastern Quebec and Labrador. And then before the Pine Grosbeaks Speaks move, Tadoussac, Quebec, which is approximately right over here, had a huge movement of boreal chickadees. One of their biggest movements of boreal chickadees in 20 years. When boreal chickadees move out of the boreal forest, it usually means a food source failure. And they were getting 100 to 200 boreal chickadees in a morning flight heading southwest. So there may be boreal chickadees somewhere in this area that we don't know about yet that have drifted. So they came down and right behind them, they were getting morning flights of two, three, four hundred pine gross peaks. They came down the north shore of the St. Lawrence River in the estuary and soon as the river was narrow enough, they just spilled across the river right into New England. And just poured straight south, some have poured west, and they're on feeders, the tiny little crab apples, mountain ash. They're just gonna strip whatever they can find to survive. Now here is the star of this year. We knew that they were up in a slight population rise. We knew they were gonna come. We didn't know what they were gonna do, what they did. We anticipated them coming, slowly working their way down through each town, each bird feeder, slowly working their way, figuring they would touch Pennsylvania, <coughs> maybe Northeastern Ohio, come down to mid Illinois and mid Michigan. They did something they haven't done in almost 50 years. They went on a, they were like a bulldozer, a high speed bulldozer. This is on a bird, 10 years of the East Bird observations for Michigan, Chicago area. That's 10 years worth of data. That's one month worth of data this year. That is the, this, the surge that they've come in. And how we were talking about Lake Michigan and you can see how the birds are coming in. Not many evening growth speaks here. A whole wall of evening growth speaks right here. They're coming in from here. They're coming in from Quebec and Northeastern Ontario. These are the birds, the big crops up here. They're slowly drifting down this way. This area of Michigan always has a breeding population of evening growth speaks. Don't know exactly why they particularly love it and they don't move, but they're always there just north of Kirkland Warbler habitat. So you see they, the evening growth speaks push this way. You see a little gap here. They're drifting here, but you see it's almost a solid line coming through Southern Ontario, Southern Michigan, right towards Chicago. These are areas where we recorded in Southern Ontario where people had over a hundred evening gross weeks in one day this fall in flight. My house is over here, I had 100. Downtown Toronto had 514 in one morning come by. They had over 500 here in Lake Huron. They swung by and went that way. There's a place called Hot Cliff where they do a hawk watch. 
almost due north of Cleveland. They had over 900 come by in one day. They had 1,300 here, 500 there come by. And they were all going that way. And they were not stopping. As I said, I had 239 evening growth speaks that recorded at my house. So I, and only one ever stopped at the feeder. Everything else was flocks heading west, southwest. They came in a big wave. We thought we were very impressed on these numbers. October 24, 25th, this big wave of fast moving evening growth speaks heading southwest, not stopping. And then October 30th put the first run to shame where they're at 1300. People haven't seen or heard about this in a long time, these big flocks moving fast and not showing any inclination of stopping. Looking at the literature and talking to older birders, this is all I could find. The city of Toronto in 1969, they had 500 in one day, November 8th, moving. These two locations are in Hamilton in the west end of Lake Ontario. Uh, same year, October 24th, 1972, 2,800 came by moving west. Approximately 10 days later, another thousand, all on a strong flight. They have not seen that. So that's almost 50 years since evening grow speaks have pulled this. So it usually means there's a population increase. And since this, we've had more move. This is the, as of today, the movement of all evening grow speaks. They're coming down here. Chicago's just on the front wall of the eruption. And there's still lots of birds to slowly work their way through. And you can see they're not coming from the Northwest or the North. They're coming from the Northeast. If you look here, the map of the right, these are the ones where evening grow speaks traditionally, historically were Western species. The literature thought when the prairies were cleared and trees are planted, when they planted box elder, they figured in the late 1800s, early 1900s, when pioneers were planting box elder, that the evening grow speaks migrated eastward, eating that seed source. Then they got to the eastern boreal and they seemed to quite like it. So right now you can see they're all the way down here. They're down in Florida and there's one at a feeder near Orlando right now. So they have made a, a big push. And you see, but where there, there's still plenty of food in the boreal forest, there's still some pretty good densities right now. So the movement has come from Quebec, these are all French speaking evening grow speaks. Say bonjour to them, not hello. This is why when a, being a finch forecaster, I didn't realize I had to have looked not just at cones, I had to look at spring weather when the trees are flowering. I had to look at summer weather for drought. And then I had to learn my insects well. Spruce budworms, you hear in the warblers, there's some, something called the budworm warblers, the three species, Cape May warbler, Tennessee warbler, and bay-breasted warbler. Their numbers rise when there's a spruce budworm outbreak because they love to feed on this very abundant food source. They're not the only ones. So these three love spruce budworms too. Purple finch and evening grosbeak beak during outbreak years, 80% of their diet turns into spruce budworms. So when the calipers come out in May from their cocoons, all the way till when they pupate in late June, early July, they're a huge food source. So the evening grow speaks and, and the purple finches can raise huge, not huge, large clutches very successfully with very little effort. So they just basically hop over, grab a mouthful of caterpillars, hop back, feed the kids, relax for a half an hour and go back and get some more. This year, when the caterpillars became, when the pupae became moss, these guys stopped feeding on them. They usually go to cherry crop then and feed on choke cherry and pin cherry. However, we had a third winter in Southern Canada. I don't know if Chicago had a third winter in May where we had about four or five days of cold temperatures and lots of snow, just when many tree species were flowering. So pretty much our wild cherry crop in the Eastern Boreal in Northeastern North America failed. So they love cherries and they weren't finding any choke cherry or pin cherry. So Tadasac Quebec Bird Observatory in September had their biggest flight of evening grosbeaks 
in 25 years for that time of year. So we knew we were getting a big flight early that they were gonna come in good numbers. We just didn't know that they were coming in generational numbers. And our pine siskins, we thought most of them were in the West. However, the ones that were in the East were in the spruce butterworm outbreaks, happily feeding on the caterpillars. And when the caterpillars, when the moss lay their eggs, these guys will happily go after the eggs first. And then they, they, when the eggs hatch in late August, September, these guys are already moved on to different food sources. They'll eat the very small caterpillars. So the, a lot of them that were in the East that gave us the inflated numbers were sitting in these large spruce butterworm outbreak forests where no one was because of COVID and that. And they were just quite happily reproducing and eating uh, their way through their food source. This is what spruce butterworm does to balsam firs and white spruces primarily. If a tree gets heavily uh, grazed by these caterpillars for about four or five years, they'll die off. So that's why they used to in the 60s and 70s used to spray, spray all kinds of really nasty chemicals to kill the caterpillars. Now they use a bacteria spore and they spray in late summer when the eggs are hatching and the tiny little caterpillars come out. And this little bacteria spore, so Bacillus thuringus, or just BT for short, it is very short lasting and it's very targeted for the caterpillars. It gets into their guts and it changes their gut flora and, and basically the caterpillars will starve themselves. So they can't make it through the winter. And next year, there won't be any food for the, uh, the finches and all that and they'll move to a different spot. And that's, they try to do that because it's such a large outbreaks and, and in North America and Canada, we have huge forestry industry lumber, pulp and paper and all that. And our trees grow slowly. So if we lose a huge chunk of forest to outbreaks, we have bad forest fires and less resource. So that's a branch that's been grazed a little heavier. So when trees get three, four years of that, they start dying when you get large hectares dying. That's what it looks like when you're driving by looking at the boreal forest. You just drive by and you're like, trees look kind of brown. I actually stopped, that's, I didn't even really know about this, this outbreak in this location. My friends in the forestry department didn't know about it either. I just drove, drove by and found it. Spruce budworms, the pert past outbreaks. When the evening growth speaks were really everywhere. People will talk back in the 70s and 80s. How they used to show up their feeders everywhere. They were because the spruce budworms had such huge outbreak. 20 million hectares in Ontario there, which 1980 was a peak. At 77,000 square miles. Quebec, which has more spruce butterworms usually, they had 52 million hectares or 200,000 square miles. Basically, the state of Illinois and the state of Wisconsin were under spruce butterworm outbreak. And 1975, when Eastern Canada, which is the maritime province of Ontario, Quebec, met, 52 million hectares, basically the size of Illinois, Iowa. Wisconsin and Indiana combined was under spruce budworm outbreak. So the spruce budworm warblers and these finches, they had a great time breeding. That's why you, when you see the trends, they had their peaking in the last 40 years or right around that same time because they had a huge food source. Spruce budworms have a natural but approximately 40 year cycle between peak and flow. This is our current 2020 situation. These are the three big outbreaks in Quebec. And these are smaller ones in Ontario, the upper Prince of Michigan, Minnesota has them, all the way in Manitoba has them, Wisconsin has them, they're all small, but these are the three big massive ones that are drawing it. So this, when the evening growth speaks came out, they went Southwest. And if they hit down towards the Great Lakes, if they're north of the lake, they got funneled by the Great Lakes right into Detroit and straight across to Chicago. The ones that went south of the lake, they spread out through New England, down the South, North Carolina, South Carolina. But these outbreaks weren't sprayed this year because of COVID. So they're getting bigger. These are smaller ones joining onto this one. And these ones will probably all grow because they're new outbreaks. 
This is the current size, 9.6 million hectares in 2019 in Quebec alone was outbreak, which equals about two thirds the size of Illinois. Right now, the offhand, off the record estimates I've been talking to biologists, they figure it's probably closer to the size of Illinois this year. Back here, Ontario Out of Breeding Bird Atlas, our estimate for population for evening gross beaks was 250,000 in Ontario. Quebec was about 400,000. 2016, as you get up the numbers, the Ontario population, Eastern Canada estimated population is 1.2 million evening gross beaks. We are what? Almost get closing in to 75, 80%, almost doubling those 2016 numbers for hectares of spruce budworm outbreak. So there's a lot of food out there for these evening gross beaks, purple finches, and pine siskins. So their population is still going up. When this was down in Quebec, their outbreak was the lowest in 2003 in the cycle. That's equivalent, 2,600 hectares is equivalent to 10 square miles. So from 10 square miles to the size of the state of Illinois, this is becoming a big outbreak, the biggest one since the mid 70s. So evening gross beaks are enjoying it and explains why they did their really fast lightning move towards the Southwest through Ontario. Future goals. I would love to expand the cone crop reporter roster. Like people in the Northern states, Illinois too, because you have, if we know what the cone crop and the birch crop is like there, we don't know where the birds will aim for. Uh, more towards Western North America and Northeastern Quebec, where there's not a lot of people to start with, but if we can get more of an idea, give us a heads up. Increase the diversity of reported background. First Nations, the various First Nation tribes that are, live in the boreal forest, have their villages in the boreal forest. There are people on the, on the land, so they know generally what's going on. And a lot of these villages are not on any paved or dirt road. They have to go in, but either fly in or winter road. So they'll, they're right in what the pine gross beaks are. More different professionals, loggers, various researchers, bird watchers, and we have some bird atlases now going on in North America where they'll send people, and Ontario has it this year in Promise of Saskatchewan, it's their second last year, where they'll send bird watchers on canoe trips in the middle of nowhere to drop you off of a float plane, say paddle these 20 kilometers, we'll see you in five days. Those people who are getting put in the areas where man usually doesn't go can provide some good insight and develop a document to assist with people to understand the cone and seed aging. When people see a tree, a tree and see pine cones on it, they don't know a lot, a lot of the pine trees, the cones are two years to, to be a mature cone. Some of the spruce trees are that, some are less. So you look at a tree and it has a lot of yellow cones, you think it's full of food, that could be last year's cones and most of the seeds have already dropped. You get species like white spruce, new cones are green before they ripen to become brown. Black spruce, they're purple. So once you can train people to know the aging of it, it makes it a lot easier to understand what's going on. These are some of the 49 people who, from coast to coast to coast, basically, who have said, went out there and looked at trees and then were uh, very patient with me when I would give them extra emails when I didn't get a report shortly after Labor Day. And I would love to get this roster three, four times the size of this. This is now the Winter Finch Report is now part of the Finch Research Network. It's based out of a off branch of Cornell. It's you want to find any of the most up-to-date Finch reports and great ID tips, they have it here. And the Winter Finch Report will be based out of here for, for the foreseeable future, probably hopefully at forever. Uh, we do updates on species movements, updates on what's happening in the boreal forest through little bit of intelligence. You guys have the most up-to-date one right now. And it's a great little source to find out more about these finches and connect with other finch lovers because I've learned that there's lots of finch lovers. And the next bird I do believe is one I saw in Japan this winter. It comes from Siberia. It comes into J Japan like and the Japanese birders look for it. It's called a palace's rose finch. 
I was going to put it, I put it in as a joke saying 99% sure I forecast this bird will not show up. Then 20, then 2020 showed up. And now I'm saying it's 99.5% it shows up. This, this is closely related to purple finches. And thank you very much for having me here. These two young lads here in the branch will say thank you too. So, Rena, hold on. Oh, okay. No, um, I'm unmuted. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. I, I, I looked at mute and thought it was on mute. Never mind. Thank you, Tyler. Um, I can't believe how current some of those maps were. It was amazing. Um, just wish I could see some of these birds. Uh, let's see, let me get a few um, questions in the chat. Other than fantastic program, thank you so much. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, let's see, somebody says, Michelle says she had pines, her, she has a friend in Phoenix that had pine siskins in her backyard yesterday in Phoenix, wow. Arizona. They, um, they're moving. Sunny's question is, with all these birds moving south, will there be an unusually high mortality due to lack of food? That is the question we're wondering. On um, Some species, they may not find food. Other ones are keying in on feeders. Like evening grosbeaks seem to be keying in on feeders quite heavily. And box elder and a lot of the ornamental plantings that are in cities that have crops. They seem to be okay. The pine gross beaks, they're this very resilient. The common red poles, they're more susceptible to freezing rain events because they can get to their weedy fields, even if it's windswept, they can get find their seeds. They're pretty quite adaptable to be living in the boreal in the dead of winter. But freezing rain is probably the worst thing for these guys because if they can't get to what food source they need, they have a fairly high metabolism. So they'll look for feeders. When you see a stormy event, coming your way on the weather network. Get ready for your feeders. It can be a few hours after the storm starts, even before the storm starts, if the local birds know what's happening, because you sense it. But it's usually a couple of days afterwards, you can tell if they were stressed because they'll still show up in your feeders in big numbers. But some species like, if the white winged crossbills, we worry if they come east of the boreal forest, of the western boreal forest come to the eastern boreal forest, there's not much food there for them. And if they come out east in any numbers, we figured they might have a little issue with with the food source, but they'll probably come down hard in big numbers. If you see white wing crossbills at bird feeders, it mm -hmm. usually means they're in trouble because the crossbills aren't a, really a big finch at, at the feeders. They love to sit in these spruce trees and eat the cones, but if they you start seeing more than one or two at a feeder, it usually means they're having some problems. The pine siskins, the way they're going, they might be in Mexico by, <laughs> or in Key West before we're done. The purple finches, they're pretty resilient, but we have, we we'll figure we'll probably lose a few of them, but there's a huge food source waiting for them in, in northeastern North America next spring. But stuff like the uh, white wing crossbills, they had a huge bumper crop last year in most of the boreal. So they probably bred, most of them probably bred at least twice, maybe three times because they'll breed it, the food's there, they'll just keep breeding. And in Alaska, they had at least two cl clutches, I heard. So they had a huge population. A lot of these finches, so they do have a, they do have a mortal, higher mortality in the winter. They can usually recover in a year or two. So you were just talking about, we had several questions about <laughs> what, what the, each species eats. You did name some of them, but maybe you could um, go over, people asking, you know, what, what do people, um, what, what feeder food do, do, do each finch like? And then there was a question about, do evening growth speaks prefer platform feeders and black oil seeds? Evening growth speaks love black oil seeds. They love, they also they do love too, is the big uh, striped sunflower seeds. They love those. They prefer platform feeders. They, they, they have an issue with trying to get that big bill in some of these smaller feeders. They love a platform feeder. If you have a nice platform feeder, and you have a flock evening growth speaks, they know that platform feeder it has black oil and other sunflower seeds, they'll be your best friend. Because then they're very social. So if a flock knows about it, 
they'll put you on their little route. A lot of these birds, you may not, you may think, oh, they're not here. They just come into your feeder when you're at work or you're out, and they have a little psych, little circuit they're doing in in a large, in a few square miles of their neighborhood, where they know where each feeder is, and they'll come and hit hit it. The red poles and the siskins, uh, the Niger seed. Niger seeds more in the tube because you have to keep Niger dry because when Niger, you need it fresh, it, it gets stale. When it gets stale, they tend not to like it. And anyway, so if you have a nice Niger feeder and no one's really touching it and you know you can see the finches are there, it's usually a good source that the Niger is old. So yeah, the, the red poles will love the Niger seed. Uh, if you have goldenrod or uh, asters, growing on your property, those, those seed heads, they love those seed heads. Uh, birch trees, birch and alder, the uh, seed crop is a big source of food for them too. Pine grow speaks, they like their black oil too. They're pretty resilient though. They, they eat buds of trees in the dead of winter. So they'll, they'll try other stuff, but yeah, black oil seems to be one of their favorite things for most of these finches. And as crossbills, They'll eat both sources, they'll eat the millet too, but usually they don't prefer to come down. They wanna be in the tops of the spruce trees. That's their, in tamaracks, that's where they prefer to be. Um, corn, yeah, corn, they're not, none of these guys are big corn lovers. None of them or all of them? Uh, the smaller finches don't care for the cracked corn. Evening grow speaks will try it occasionally, but it's not their favorite food. Okay. I had. If you have cracked corn, mixed seed, and your neighbor has black oil, they're going to visit your neighbor. Um, I had a funny comment before I get to another one. Jennifer says, Finch eruption, the only good thing about 2020. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, we also had. Um, Oh, well, I had a question and then I'll, I'll get to Maureen's. So will they stay then for the winter? When will they go start going north? Uh, the, the red poles will start moving early March, slowly drifting up. Evening grow speaks, they'll start moving sometime in March, but usually it's April, May when they all start moving back in numbers because they don't want to go get up home when it's still snowy and the caterpillars aren't out yet. They want to arrive just when their food source is showing up. Purple finches are usually late April, early May bird drifting north. Okay. Siskins, similar time too. So they pretty much stay for the winter yeah. then. Yeah, they may move, they'll move around. But once they get set in a, a certain area and they know the food source, they'll just do a circuit. This is a question I had, but Karen asked it. So thanks for the reminder. What causes good or bad crops of pine cones? Uh, it's various. Pine cones can't produce, the like conifers can't produce every year. So they're slightly cyclical. And if you can get good weather when they're flowering, like people don't realize pine trees and all the conifers do have flowers. If they have good weather when they're flowering, they start producing the cones. And if it, it gets too dry and all that, they'll abort the cones and stop growing them or grow a few of them. However, if you have bad weather when they're flowering, that cuts them right there so the crop doesn't even start. Like the balsam fir crop, they were also, a lot of these trees this year in the boreal were exhausted from last year. They had such huge cone crops. You'd drive through the boreal forest last year and you were just watching spruce tree after tamarack tree after the fir tree bending from the weight of the cones. Wow. So if, if 2019 boreal forest was in 2020, it would make this year even worse. Because last year the birds didn't even leave. They were happy. People, the forecast last year, Ron Pittaway said, if you want to see finches, go north. Because <laughs> they're not coming south. And they were happily staying up north. Okay, we're going to ask two more questions. Um, a short one and then a longer one. Ruth asked if rosy finches are included in this eruption. Uh, no. Okay. Because ro rosies are more of a mountain bird. Yeah. Yeah. And the ones in the northwest will drift to the east, but they tend to be more going by altitude in the mountain ranges, dropping up from high, high altitude to low altitude in the mountain ranges. But that said, one showed up in northern Ontario a week ago and stayed at a feeder for five days 
Oh, wow. And then, it, then it's disappeared. So it might show up on your side of Lake Superior. Well, go to New Mexico. Of course, right now you can't go anywhere, but yeah. <laughs> go to New Mexico for road. Yeah, we can't go across the border. Right now. Okay. Um, Maureen asked this earlier. I'm going to ask this as the last question. She says, can you show us the slide with the tree species on it again? Which of these trees grow in Illinois, specifically Lake and Cook County? I don't know if you know that. Okay. Do non-native species of spruces support finch populations? Uh, non-native species of spruces are supporting them this year. It, that is basically a huge source of food for them this year, away from feeders. Second here, dude. Right. Yeah, if anyone goes to Zach Simbog up here, you're really close to the big crop. And I got a feeling Zach Simbog's gonna be interesting this year. Ooh. Uh, Eastern white pine, <laughs> it's in Illinois. Red pine, I don't know how far south it goes there. White spruce is probably northern Illinois. Black spruce is probably too far north. Balsam fir is probably too far north. Tamarack, I think there's some there. Yeah. You have an extra, you have another species of birch there, river birch in Illinois, which is a, another big source of food. So more than one in the river stream areas, look for that one. Alder is a good source that's down there. Red cedar, I was told it's fairly common in Illinois. That is a big source. Pine grow speaks love it. And if you get bohemian wax wings that make it down there, oh. they they love two things. They absolutely love two things, European buckthorn and red cedars. <laughs> and they will sit there. I We get them in Southern Ontario. When they find red cedar crop, they will sit there and they'll just build up in hundreds of birds and flocks and they will strip the whole crop where they are and then slowly move. Like, like a locust plague, stripping all the berries on the way through. And we had a push just after the second evening gross big, big push on the same flight line of several hundred Bohemian wax wings. Don't know where they are now, but they're out of Ontario somewhere between Detroit and you. So if you see a flock that looks like an odd flying flock of starlings, take an extra look at them. Uh, other ones, mountain ash species. There's some natives around in Illinois. There's lots of ornamental ones planted in towns. That's another huge source. Eastern white cedar, it's in Illinois. The hemlocks are in Illinois and down into the Smokies. Maples, ashes, they're good sources. The box elder, which People also call it a garbage tree. It lives fast and dies young, but it produces. It's a lot of times you see it in uh, brown fields and old vacant lots where it's the weed tree that grows up there, and tend to get tends to get ignored by most naturalists, and most people. But it has maple keys, and those maple keys tend to stay on all winter long. And evening grow speaks love those. And whatever fruiting um, bush you have out there, with the robins, if the robins are eating something. A lot of these other guys will take a look at it too. Evening grow speaks purple finches will also eat berries as well. Yeah, Maureen's follow up question. This is the last thing. Does anything eat buds of arborvitae? Ar arborvitae? Oh. No. oh, there's something that was happening in BC that was eating that. I just can't remember. Sorry, I can't remember right offhand, but I just heard that the other day. Well, in, in email me and I'll tell They had some. Well, so the next thing is, I don't know how to identify any of these trees. So that's my, <laughs> that's my next thing. But Tyler, thank you so much for your time. And um, everybody, so just you want to unmute everybody. Um, yes. and Tyler, yeah. Thank Yay. you so much. Oh. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And, and, and very timely. And now I have to go out and look for even more foods. Um, so uh, I will say good night, but, but thanks again for your time and I will be in touch with you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank okay. you. Thank thanks, you. Tyler. Good evening, everyone. Good night. Bye bye. bye. Thank you. Terrific, terrific show. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Hi, Bonnie. Hi, Bonnie. Hi, guys. Thanks, Tyler. Just. Uh... Hang on for the rest of you who have nothing else to do this evening. <laughs> <laughs>
is this is Giving Tuesday. It could be most <laughs> of us, Sonny. <laughs> what? Was Lynn? I said that could be most of us. Yeah, no. <laughs> Rena, Rena, we may have a new plant list for Peter Gordon. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> That's funny. Honey, do you not see me having Lee's meeting? 